You've seen the spoiler-free review. Now let's get into the nitty-gritty that is Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. The following is a world-class bullshitters exclusive. So folks, yesterday we saw Ghostbusters Frozen Empire and we gave an in-depth review without any spoilers. And now today we're going to talk about the film in a different way, but we're going to talk about the spoilers because there was a lot to unpack. Let me rephrase that. There wasn't a whole lot to unpack with this movie and that is why I didn't really like it. See, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire suffers that same terrible, debilitating disease that other entertainment properties of the past suffer. The dreaded N-word. No, not that N-word, though. Well... I'm not going to talk about that right now, but the other N-word that we really, really hate, the one that is ruining entertainment, nostalgia. Now, I enjoy nostalgia. This shelf behind me is nostalgia. It takes me back in time, and it helps me remember my life. It lets me look back and reflect on some of the happiest times. These are old relics of the past. Stuff new, stuff old, it reminds me of the stuff I liked. But what you don't see behind me is new stuff trying to pass itself off as the old stuff, trying to make me feel the way I used to. So for example, those Power Rangers, the big ones that you can see on camera, those are awesome, those are cool, but they're never gonna replace what came before it, the original ones and how I feel about those. And that's how I feel about Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. The original Ghostbusters is a 10 out of 10 perfect movie. This new film is not that great. What it does is it relies on nostalgia to overlook the lack of action, the lack of exciting plot. This movie feels like a stop along the Ghostbusters train line. It's like, hey, this is the stop where we look at technology and kind of talk for most of the movie because allegedly the budget was very small. And so, well, we don't really have an action-packed Ghostbusters film. So let's take it back to the beginning for those who want to know what this film is about and why you might not want to see it. Now, I'm not going to tell you that this is some garbage, woke, trash film. I don't talk like that, okay? This movie isn't good for many other reasons. It's lacking an exciting plot. It's lacking feeling. It's lacking emotion. If you liked Ghostbusters Afterlife, you probably liked it because of the way it made you feel right here, especially seeing Egon appear on screen. I can still feel it right here when I think about that scene because that is the only way you were ever going to be able to get the original four Ghostbusters together. And unlike most of this CGI crap with Princess Leia and Grandma Tarkin or fucking or Lawrence Olivier and Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow, this one from Ghostbusters Afterlife really worked. So I was living in a place where the Ghostbusters had been returned to form. You know, maybe Harold Ramis is no longer with us, but we got that final Ghostbusters movie. It was directed by the son of the original director, uh, Jason Reitman, son of Ivan, who this film, Frozen Empire, is dedicated to. And so I'm going into Ghostbusters feeling really good. And I'm also going into this film with a completely blank slate. Did I see reviews that were bad? Yeah, but I don't care because if I'm going to review it for you guys, I'm going to give you our take. I don't just parrot the opinions of other people. That's why we're here, to show you how full of shit the other people are. And we come to you in a different way, in a way you guys like. You know in the trailer where you see Ecto-1 racing around the streets of New York City? Well, that is the opening of this film. And it's pretty cool. I gotta say, it's it's fun. It's nice. You see the Ecto-1 driving around. You see new gadgets. You see new weapons. You see the ghost trap that's a drone. It looks really cool, and it's very visually interesting. And then that's kind of it until the end. Now, I'm not expecting over-the-top explosions every five seconds. This is Ghostbusters. Hell, when I did Wokebusters, the Ghostbusters parody comic that's about to come out, I had to figure out how to add action to a Ghostbusters-style story because it's a different medium, and you need to be able to show more than just tell. And this film somehow has less exciting action than the film from 84, which the film from 84 is just a comedy with a couple of scenes thrown in there. This isn't necessarily funny. What this film does is try to tug at your heartstrings. And yeah, just like that. It tugs at your heartstrings to try to make you feel something. It's trying to cash in on your, your remembering of Harold Ramis and that he's passed away and that you miss him. They're trying to put that onto this Phoebe character. We're supposed to feel what she feels, her emotions. But it's not very entertaining to watch. The whole story of Phoebe... Well, hold on, I'll tell you in just a second. So the whole story of Phoebe kind of ties in with the opening scene. The Ghostbusters are seen capturing this dragon from the sewer and they destroy a lot of the city and we see the damage caused they destroy a building well they like rip the side of a building out they cut some street signs up they crash a bunch of cars well two priuses but then you see them meet the mayor played by walter peck yeah walter peck went from epa to the mayor of new york city so he leveled up big time it's kind of interesting how everybody except the ghostbusters the characters that we all like um did a lot with their lives only winston is a huge hit. 
Ray still owns a cult shop. Venkman is a scientist. You know what? Let's take that back. All the old characters that you like are interesting. All the new characters are pretty good too. And that's why it's hard to not like this movie. Because this isn't a Star Wars situation where you're going to hate Rey, uh, Phoebe. She's not a bad character at all. What I find is I don't care enough to get invested in the story. So after the whole debacle in New York City, Phoebe is essentially fired from the Ghostbusters because she's underage. And so we're supposed to sit there and feel for her that she's this brilliant, un, you know, misunderstood scientist and she's as good as an adult, but she's not allowed to be a Ghostbuster and she can't comprehend why. And I don't really care because I just watched them commit uh, acts of destruction across New York City. And so, in the first one, it felt justified that the Ghostbusters were trying to go out and do stuff, and we only really saw them destroy the Sedgwick. We didn't see the Ghostbusters fight another ghost till the end of the film, and of course they destroyed the top of uh, Dana Barrett's building, but that's also because an interdimensional being was trying to cross over and destroy our reality. We're just watching them fight one ghost that is in a sewer and doesn't really cause a lot of damage outside of that sewer, but they destroy a bunch of the city, thus costing a lot of money. I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm at the age where I understand Walter Peck a little bit. In the first one, he's a dick, well, dickless. And in this one, he's not a nice guy, but the other Ghostbusters are kind of stupid. And so when you find out that they, uh, you know, destroy shit and just willy-nilly, you're kind of like, okay. And it's not even like a funny destruction. It's just kind of like, oh, you guys do kind of suck. And later in the film, too, we see Phoebe uh, go to a Ghostbusters call. She shoots out a window, destroys a diner, and just leaves. It's not really addressed. It's shit like that. It's like a running gag that's not very funny. So after Phoebe is uh, fired from the Ghostbusters, we see her walk around forlorn. She's upset. Oh, I'm a teenager. Why doesn't anybody treat me like an adult? Whatever. She ends up befriending a teenage ghost. Not Casper, though this movie actually borrows from Casper. So remember how in Casper, um, Christina Ricci wants to die so she can dance with Casper or he becomes a boy or something like that where they can get on the same plane of existence? This movie copies that. There's a scene in this movie where Phoebe kills herself so her and her ghost pal can become best buddies and they can understand what it's like to be each other and then that opens the rift to destroy the world. So Phoebe, this great character that is so smart, is the really the harbinger of doom because none of this shit would have went down if she wasn't an angsty teenager really if they didn't have a kid on the ghostbusters there would be no problem they wouldn't have destroyed new york killed people caused property damage any of this shit all of it would have been avoided had phoebe never been a ghostbuster but we gotta continue family legacy in all of these movies it's all about family 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 fuck if you're not a part of the family Take the name, you're part of the family too. My new name is Dr. Jeff Spengler. I'm part of the crew. Actually, that happens in the movie. Um, Paul Rudd takes the family name at the end. So he's going to get married. He's going to be dad. He's going to be all these things. But he's also going to be a Spengler because Gary Gruberson, he doesn't care about his name anymore. Kind of a weird joke. Not really like a problem joke. It's just kind of like, all right, that's joke. Eh, I don't find it that funny. So... While Phoebe is fired from the Ghostbusters, and by the way, folks, I'm sorry that I jump around, but um, much like House of Pain, it's hard to stay on one narrow path because there's a lot to talk about in this movie. So hopefully, in my mad ramblings, the plot of this movie makes sense. Realistically, it's not that important to understand the plot of the film. And so a lot of it is just teenage angst, and I'm not a teenager, so I don't really care. But the rest of the story is this. We see Ray as a cult shop, Kamel Nabjabi, who plays a... Uh, a 50-year-old millennial or a 50-year-old Gen Z. He's got his frosted tips. He's a fucking slacker. He cares about nothing. Mr. Strickland from Back to the Future would have kicked his ass out of school. So this guy isn't anything. Well, long story short, he's a descendant of a fire brand keeper. Like, he's the fire keeper. There's the gatekeeper in the original one. Sorry, the key master in the original film and the fire master in this film. So again, they're kind of borrowing the bullshit from the original film. So anyway, uh, he sells his grandma's ancient object to Ray. It turns out that it is a, a ball that traps a spirit that can freeze people. And so it goes to this Ghostbusters research facility. And now here's a part of the movie that's actually really cool. is the Ghostbusters research facility run and funded by Winston. And Winston has always been an equal Ghostbuster. This whole mentality of whatever is bullshit. Now, here's the part where I want to like parse the details. 
Ernie Hudson wasn't really treated that fairly um, in terms of like the studio. They wouldn't even hire him to do the voice work after Ghostbusters for the cartoon, and he had trouble finding work. So Ernie Hudson's very public about how Ghostbusters was a great thing for him, but it also wasn't this life changer. Like he had to go right back to work after type of thing. So, but character wise, Winston has always been like, just there and cool and awesome just like the other guys and so now Winston is rich and successful and he owns businesses and he owns the Ghostbusters research facility it's really nice to see a character like Winston be more developed than ever before because before he's just a, a workman you know he's the everyman we can understand it but he is so passionate about ghost busting and what they do and he has invested millions of dollars into it so it's kind of nice it makes you feel all warm and fuzzy that the guy that started at the bottom is now at the top and he really is caring i would have hated if this movie would have had ray and the guys you know like ray and venkman still be into it and winston be like oh I'm be it's beneath me this and that no 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 no. winston is really uh the heart of the ghostbusters team now and i love it so you go into this research facility and you see gadgets and gear and a way to separate possessed objects from the spirit within it and so i had mentioned earlier about the whole death thing and so we'll get to that in just a second so anyway, they research the object. It, uh, you know, it has, it, like, does, it shuts down the power, essentially. It's so evil and so possessed that as they try to remove the sphere, the spirit from the sphere, it, you know, shuts down all the reactors and the grids and all the ghosts start to escape. And you think, oh, man, it's going to be an epic ghost fight. And then the power comes back on. This movie's kind of like a honey dick. It's like a tease. It's just the tip. And you're about to go, nope, pull it out. That's, that's kind of how this movie feels. And so... You get this tease, and then it builds more exposition. Because here's the thing, there are a lot of characters in this movie, and you need stuff for them to do, but none of the characters do very interesting things. Even Phoebe spends most of her time just moping. Uh, does she come up with something brilliant towards the end? She tries, then it fails. And that's the thing about this. This isn't like this brilliant ghost buster. This is just a kid trying to pick up the legacy of her granddad. And it's fine. It works. That's not the problem with this movie. Um, problem is, you just have these scenes happen that are there to not really... They further the story. I'd be lying if I didn't say they did. But they also feel like a member, Barry. So we see a couple of the characters go to do more research about this... Um, the, the ancient text on the ball. This ancient pre-Sumerian whatever it is. So they go to the library from the first movie. Because it's just, you know, the New York library. But, like, you see the library ghost. And you're like, oh, I remember the library ghost and then the library ghost turns into the monster and you go i remember ghostbusters from 1984 and that was a great movie and look at this scene that's all it exists for and then you meet pat and oswald and it sucks the uh it really there was no energy in the scene it's literally dan Aykroyd walking by it, looking at it and walking away it's like hey remember this awesome that's as deep as this movie is so they go down they learn about the text and the story behind this orb because humanity had once defeated it these fire keepers were ancient ghostbusters the, yeah the ghostbusters are now part of an ancient lineage essentially stupid and that's not the only thing they do to tie in the world of ghostbusters together it, it i fucking don't like it so anyway uh they get the information from pat and oswald the thing escapes because there is this ghost that you learn it's a possession ghost and it's just a red dot that jumps from thing to thing so maybe that's their way of not spending money on stuff but this possession ghost um steals a recording that they have of the ancient text and it goes out and it destroys this thing and then all of a sudden it possesses the lions outside of the library and you get a neat scene it's very cool but it's not that original because I'm positive it happened in an Amazing Spider-Man comic in the late 80s. You know, the scene lacks originality, but it doesn't lack uh, visual appeal. But the problem is it takes place over the course of like 8 to 10 seconds. And so while I don't like overly elaborate action scenes like in Marvel movies, uh, this movie doesn't have anything that lets you sink your teeth into it. For example, the, the, the climax of Ghostbusters is maybe 20, 30 minutes long. Once they get to the, the high rise of Dana Barrett. Now I know that this is a mid movie action scene, but they don't like ever expound upon much. Wait till we talk about the climax in just a minute. It's very disappointing. So once they discover Kumail Nabjabi is this fire keeper, uh, they take him back to the lab and, Sorry, they take him and they do research on him, just like in the original film. Remember how they put the thing on Lewis's head and he thinks he's a god and all this shit? They do that with Kumail Nanjabi. Venkman comes in for this scene and he's doing the research. And uh, anytime they trigger him, which we have in Wokebusters, uh, by throwing a pen at him, it causes a fire to go up. So his emotions can control fire. More on that later, I guess. 
we actually see him spend the rest of the movie trying to take a candle in like a lighter and literally bend a flame to hit a candle and it's it's fine but it's avatar essentially what happens is we're following Phoebe this whole time being angsty and a 15-year-old girl and all this other shit. I've never been one, so I don't know how it feels to be one, but I'm glad I'm not. So Phoebe's been dejected from being fired from the Ghostbusters, and what she does is she had befriended this teenage ghost, like I had said earlier. They play chess together. They hang out together. They're like sisters. I don't really get it. My point is... Phoebe wants to kill herself to become like a ghost, and she does, and when she kills herself by sucking her spirit from that, she jumps in the machine that pulls the spirit from an object, well, her body is the object, and her spirit gets pulled out, and we see Phoebe as a ghost. Only problem is, when that happens, that allows the villain to connect to her spirit, then connect to her body, say the evil words, to then release him into the real world. And so Phoebe is responsible for setting uh, the world on, or destroying the world with ice. So the villain escapes, the Ghostbusters need to hunker down and fight the battle. So the climax, uh, we're pretty much here at this point, takes place at the Ghostbusters firehouse. And I know you're thinking to yourself, oh man, Ghostbusters firehouse climax, awesome. No, not awesome, stupid. What happens in this movie is they fortify, they get ready to fight. Um, then the blizzard comes in and oh man, it's time to go. And so... You know, Bankman comes in, and all the cool shit from the trailer's here. Because that trailer is the climax of the movie. So, you know how in Ghostbusters you got the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, and Gozer, and the Demon Dogs, or in 2 you got Vigo the Carpathian, and all this other shit that's going down? This one is this CGI guy, who eventually, I think he becomes a puppet at some point, so he doesn't look bad. Like, I want to preface this, the CGI in this movie is pretty good. It doesn't need to be overly used. I don't want to present myself as a guy who is looking for CGI, uh, you know, porn, essentially, where it's like, oh my god, look at the graphics. It's a movie, okay? It's supposed to be a film. But this is also Ghostbusters, and the stakes aren't enough. You know, this isn't James Bond, where after Moonraker you need to bring it down with your free eyes only, and if you do, there's still tension and still excitement and still really good storytelling. This movie has a little bit of heart, but it's trying to pull at your heartstrings from the past again. So the climax, we go into the fight, it appears, Phoebe, you know, being the whiz kid that she is, goes, wait, brass can trap it, I'm going to dip my coil in brass, and then I'm going to destroy the creature, and it doesn't really work, it like stops it for a second, and then, you know, it destroy. it freezes her, it freezes everybody, and this is what I wanted to talk about yesterday in the spoiler-free review, this movie tells you that the Ghostbusters firehouse is this, like, beacon or this icon this important place but we watch the ghostbusters interact with it for the first time it's a joke they act like they chose it because it represented something more they chose the firehouse because it was this ancient whatever the firehouse was chosen because ray is a child and he wanted to have a fun time like we should stay here tonight they didn't give a shit that it was crappy they wanted to play grown-up firefighters that's what ghost busting is folks I wasn't alive for Ghostbusters, but the way I look at pop culture and history is there are certain things that people look to as cool professions. You know, my grandma was very old when she died, but she always referred to cowgirls as like the coolest thing. Much like people talk about Jedis today or Ghostbusters today. You know, all of these things came from something else. The cowboy, the cowgirl, the astronaut, all of these things were cool and we add more to create these fictional things that people look up to. So what would a guy in the 80s who grew up in the 50s think is a cool, noble profession? Who would be a hero? A firefighter. So the joke in the original Ghostbusters is they're broke. They put the house up for the loan with a stupid amount of interest and then they buy a piece of shit that's fallen apart and they didn't really want to buy it but Ray was so excited for like being a child essentially like we should sleep here tonight it's great. Like that joke is ruined because they act like the Ghostbusters firehouse is an iconic thing that these guys have picked out because of its you know spiritual whatever fucking stupid and then you get to the then you get to what i'm trying to get at though so basically what happens is the ghost enters that garage where the ecto-1 shoots out phoebe stops it it freezes everybody finn wolfhard who's still around goes to the basement shoots out the floor the thing falls into the floor and that's it it dies everyone everyone is unthawed and they all survive like anybody that's like oh man are the ghostbusters gonna die they're not even really in peril and I don't mean just the older guys, the ones that we all like. If the kids aren't really in peril. The girl freezes for a second. Phoebe kills herself, so it's not really peril if you do it yourself. And then the day is saved. What happens is everyone's unthawed. 
Uh, and the people are like, we love the Ghostbusters, you saved us all! They drive away, and the Ghostbusters theme plays, and they're like, they live to fight another day. It was underwhelming. Now, I know I've talked about this film for quite a while. I may have said things that you really enjoy, but what I didn't enjoy is the overall structure of this movie. It wasn't anything exciting, and the reason this film exists is for one thing, money, and it shows on screen. Like I said yesterday, I am a huge Ghostbusters fan. I love Ghostbusters. I feel like Afterlife was so necessary to right the ship because 2016 was a bad film. And anyone that tells you, oh, nobody cared, people did care because what happens when you put out a subpar film in a franchise or something that takes away the meaning or attacks fans or any of those things that it does, people fight back. Before the pushback to Disney Star Wars, because a lot of people were kissing The Force Awakens ass because of nostalgia, um, then The Last Jedi comes out and it changes everything. This film is not egregious like The Last Jedi. The original characters are awesome. You know, Winston and Ray and Venkman, for the time that they're there, they're fun. Dan Aykroyd has the biggest presence, and I liked it. I liked how he's like, oh, I wonder what it would be like to be a ghost and all of this stuff. It's supposed to mirror the Phoebe part. But if Phoebe is so brilliant, she should know that it's not smart to do that. And if you're trying to tell me she's just a child, then I will respond with, she should not be a Ghostbuster. Trying to sell stuff to the next generation by putting the next generation in it is kind of stupid if the story makes no sense. I've never watched a Ghostbusters film where I sympathize with the villains, meaning society. Like, I get it. You should not have kids running around with proton packs. You shouldn't have kids going to places and blowing out windows. Like, remember Podcast? What does he do? He works with Ray to produce a YouTube series. That makes sense. What does the other girl do? She works at the research facility. That makes sense. Finn Wolfhard's an adult, technically. What does he spend this movie doing? Cleaning the firehouse. He's got the most useless role in this film. He cleans the firehouse. He interacts with Slimer. It's not that funny. The mom's useless. Paul Rudd's there. He, they try to make Paul Rudd this like father figure that wants to be a part of the family. And again, it's Paul Rudd, so it's hard to you know shit on him. But it's not really that emotional. I don't watch it and go, oh man, Paul Rudd, I really, really, really like what they're doing with him. Yeah, he's just... It's like... He's awesome, and that's cool, but he doesn't do much. And much like this film, you've been sold on something that's an epic, something that's big, something that you're going to go, wow, Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire. The problem is, either the images that you've seen, like the parkas and all these action shots, they're not in the movie. There's never a scene where New York freezes and the Ghostbusters look up at the Statue of Liberty or the fucking Empire State Building or any of that. None of those cool things happen. What happens in this movie is it freezes, the car freezes, and the thing, like, nothing epic happens. The fight takes place in the mechanics bay of the firehouse. It's not cool. It's not exciting. It's, if you remember, weird, weird, weird pull from back in the 90s, but if you remember that episode of Full House where, where Michelle orders that toy and she sends in all the proofs of purchases thinking she's going to get this big, giant toy and she gets this little, bitty toy, she feels honey dick. Or, for example, Ralphie in A Christmas Story. He's got his little orphan Annie decoder ring. And, you know, he's in there. He's doing the thing. He's writing the code down. He gets upstairs. B-E-S-U-R. Be sure. Be sure to what? Be sure to drink your Ovaltine. A crummy commercial. Well, son of a bitch, that's what this movie feels like. A crummy commercial. You get the coolest parts in the commercial, and then the rest of the movie is a waste of your goddamn time. I can't stress enough, folks. If time is limited, you might want to pass this film in theaters. We have this system here on the channel where we talk about skip it, stream it, or buy it on physical media. I'm not going to say skip this movie. It is not bad. It's not good, though. It's kind of disappointing. What it is, is it's a streaming film. If you don't feel the need to go hang out with other Ghostbusters cosplayers or people that can quote the movie, if you're just a movie goer in general, or you're a diehard Ghostbusters fan whose standards are this high where they should be for everything, everybody out there, this movie doesn't really deserve you. This movie is basic Ghostbusters. It's, you know, Ghostbusters for dummies. We got the imagery, we got this, we got the member berries out the ass, but what we don't have is something fun. And that's all I wanted out of Ghostbusters is something fun. I'm not looking for something deep and complex. I'm not looking for anything besides, did I have a good time watching this? The answer was no. I didn't enjoy myself. Ghostbusters Frozen Empire was a smidge boring. Dare I say, very boring. The gear porn and all cool stuff that makes Ghostbusting Ghostbusting is awesome. But this is another reminder of society. And I'm not just putting this on Hollywood. I'm talking about people who see this movie too. They forget what Ghostbusters actually is. It's not this franchise that can be turned into anything. 
it really is four guys. It's the magic of Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Harold Ramis, and Ernie Hudson. Then you got to put in the magic of Rick Moranis, Sigourney Weaver, uh, Bill Atherton, and a couple other actors, Reginald Vell Johnson. Ghostbusters is a fucking 80s comedy that had science fiction and horror elements. That's what Ghostbusters is. We keep for, we keep treating Ghostbusters like it's Star Wars just because it's as culturally important as Star Wars and as good as Star Wars. It's not this action movie or it's not this story of family. It's a going into business comedy about four guys, three technically and one higher, who create a business that fights the paranormal and the 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 scenario and the plot is outrageous and the performances are hilarious. That's what Ghostbusters, that's the magic of Ghostbusters. This feels like the cartoon or like Ghostbusters 2, where Sony or Columbia Pictures or whoever's in charge is clearly just cashing in on your memories and nostalgia. If that's enough for you, then you're probably going to like this movie. But personally, I and millions of other people out there expect more from our entertainment, especially as inflation increases. And here's the thing. They want to charge you $30 for a popcorn bucket that holds a cup of popcorn like that fucking ghost trap. It might be scaled, but the popcorn is this big. So don't go spending $30. They wanted $30 for a tub that had the logo on it. That's bullshit, okay? That's what this movie really is. It's a big television commercial a leprechaun man a leprechaun man they trick you into thinking i'm gonna see this great movie i'm gonna have i'm having fun it's the ghostbusters but it you know it's not all marshmallows it's mostly the grain pieces of your lucky charms so if you like a bowl full of grain pieces awesome if you're looking for some fun memories yeah you kind of get it like they don't shit on anybody but the Ghostbusters' best days are behind them. And while I'm very fine with this movie existing, I don't think it ruins the legacy, I think it's just disappointing. And there's nowhere to go but up from here, because if they somehow follow up this movie and it's worse than this one, I'm going to be done with anything new Ghostbusters. This 2016 one was shit. The Afterlife was good. And then Frozen Empire is a big step beneath that. So if I'm going to rank the Ghostbusters films, it's very easy. It goes Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters 2, Ghostbusters Afterlife, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Every episode of the real Ghostbusters, and I haven't seen every episode, but I'm sure they're pretty good. Ghostbusters Extreme, Ghostbusters 2009, the video game, any comic book from Ghostbusters, um, the commercial that plays from Ghostbusters, or the scene in Casper the Friendly Ghost. I would rank it that way. Then I'll put Ghostbusters 2016 on that list because that movie is bad. But folks, I wish this movie was good. I wish this movie was great, but I can't say it. So I gave it a stream. Go out and watch it eventually. If you feel inclined to, go watch it in theaters tonight. I want to put this out there because I'm going to do more of these. Like People liked the Barbie review. People liked the Madam Web review. People liked the reviews that I talk about a movie. Um, we're going to be talking more about movies. But at the end of the day, folks, all I'm trying to do is save you time because your time is finite. So I'm thankful that you spend your time watching us. I don't want you to go spend $50 and three hours of your life to watch Ghostbusters Frozen Empire if you're not really going to know what's in it. It's not this awesome epic where they fight ghosts in the ice. It doesn't happen. It's it's really disappointing. There's nothing in this movie that reaches the highs of even Ghostbusters 2. And I don't really love Ghostbusters 2. Oh, I did want to bring this up, though. They have a Ghostbusters 2 reference. Remember that sunglasses scene where they're in the... Uh, the 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 jewelry store and all the you know the diamonds are floating and they put the laser then that in that uh cut scene or what not the cut scene in the um in the montage yeah vankman puts on the sunglasses kind of looks to the camera takes them off and it's never addressed again like that's the level of member berries that ghostbusters frozen empire is and then on top of it they throw a four ivan at the end and it's really saccharine because if anybody is tricked into like finding this a movie great because it's dedicated to ivan reitman ivan reitman deserves better Ghostbusters deserves better. Okay? That's it. That's all I got to say about the film. Um, folks, I love Ghostbusters. I spent three years of my life making Wokebusters. Uh, it'll be launching very, very soon. Follow us on social media. Get involved with the campaign that's coming up. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's 105 pages long. It is a huge epic. All right? If you're lacking Ghostbusters-style action with Frozen Empire, well, then Wokebusters is for you. Not only do we fight uh, colorful, outrage monsters, we fight this giant blue bastard and it is an epic fight so you know how the ghostbusters 
kind of fight the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, you know, they destroy Gozer and it causes a chain reaction as the thing's crawling up. Like, the Woke Busters actually fight this big-ass thing, and it's funny, it's epic, it's cool, and it's everything you guys want. But it also is much deeper than just an action-packed story with a couple of social commentary pieces in a Ghostbusters vein. Woke Busters is a lot of different things, but the number one thing that it is is the comic book event of 2024, 2025, and everything moving forward. Folks, there has never been an independent produced comic book fuck that there's never been a comic book produced like woke busters this thing is a graphic novel it is an epic and we all know that society is looking for the next great thing and well woke busters is that and a whole lot more so if you are a ghostbusters fan you're gonna love this book if you are a fan of comedy you're gonna love this book if you're a human being on the planet earth who speaks english because the book is only in english you're going to love this book. And folks, the hype is high, the demand keeps getting higher, and eventually we'll translate it into every language. Because Woke Busters isn't a story about dumping on woke people or this or that. It's so much more that I can't even tell you in this video. Well, folks, it's big, it's huge, it's funny, it's action-packed, it's everything you want it to be. So, it's almost here, I can't wait, and it was worth the wait. Three years is a long time to be living with Ghostbusters, but then again, it's Ghostbusters and Wokebusters, and they're the two of the things that make me the happiest on the planet. So thank you for watching, folks. It's greatly appreciated that you're here each and every day with us on the channel. Today is Horror Hound here in Cincinnati, so make sure you hang out with us at the convention. And guess what? We're going to have Wokebusters stuff out the ass. I got six-foot-tall cardboard cutouts of the covers showing up. I got banners, displays, everything. This book is bigger than a movie, so be on the lookout for all the stuff that I got planned coming from this convention. Check us out live check us out live each and every time we go live on tuesdays at 9 thursdays at 8 30 and get ready we're going to be creating more shows because those numbers keep going up and you guys want more so we'll go live more days of the week thank you youtube kind of but thank you twitter and all the other shit that's been growing over there so folks thank you for watching be smart be safe be cool but always be excellent to each other